was just, it was neat to see our kids sharing really about, not just about our school, but those books they're giving out can reach people's hearts for Jesus. I remember when I came back to church, oh, I'm going back to, I went to private school, public school, but I left the church. I don't think some of my students know that. Now you do. But when I came back, I found a book in my parents' basement. I think it was Steps to Christ. That's kind of, I call it the AA book for Christians, you know, (laughs) the 12 Steps. So if you get that book out, it's one of my favorite books. I got a quote from that today in my sermon. I'm not to my sermon yet, sorry. Is that okay? It's going to be a shorter one than my last sermon. Um, But I think those books, you never know as those books get into those houses, Gage, that happiness digest, she might not read it right then. But I've heard stories, you know, they set it down, gets put in a box, and then they're moving or thinking about moving or something, and they, they open that up, and they go, wow, God is good. God is good. Amen? All right, now to my sermon. The title today is, Oh, to be called a friend. Now, this isn't a sermon about Facebook, in case you were wondering. Um, now, I'm not necessarily for or against Facebook. We have a Facebook page for our school, right? Just put a picture on there of me getting dunked in the dunk tank this summer at the community picnic that we had. Um, So Facebook isn't all bad. I read this morning that there's 2 billion users of Facebook, 1 billion a day that use it on a daily basis on an average. So lots and lots of friends on Facebook, right? And I, with my cousin, who she went to Union while I was up there finishing my education to become a teacher, and she would come hang out at my wife and I's apartment a lot, and she would always be talking about, well, my friends, and we'd say, well, is this a real friend, or is this just like a, a friend, you know, <laughs> Facebook friend, or, <laughs> you know? And she would always have to say, no, this is a real friend. This is a real friend. So we're going to talk about being called a friend. And I'm going to say a real friend today. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times. A friend loves at all times. So keep that in the back of your minds as we go through our Bible study today. A friend loves at all times. My wife and I just got back from a last vacation before the school year begins. We went to Colorado for four days. We have a cat. Anybody else have a cat or cats? All right. I'm a cat person. I used to think I'd just be a dog person. But this cat, he's awesome. And I guess it kind of depends. I've seen some really nasty cats, of course. But this guy, he's, he loves us. And it's very rare that you find him not laying around in our vicinity. We ask each other, my wife and I ask each other, where's, where's Blaze? Because it's weird if we can't see him. He's always hanging around because he loves to be with us. And we had some relatives look after him while we were on the trip. You know, we weren't totally cruel and just left him by himself to fend for himself. But... When we return from trips, we we have seen he has a predictable routine. Maybe some of you cat owners are familiar with this. Uh, The first day we return, he purrs almost for the next 24 hours. Oh, he's so happy to see us, right? You guys are back. And he's like over snuggly. Usually he's just kind of like around us and wants to keep his distance. But this is like, oh man. Got to get his smell all on us again, right? And his hairs. I got to get off every Sabbath. But um, he, uh, so that's the first day back. Second day, he gets really cranky. Really cranky. Like, 
how you should never leave this house again. <laughs> Don't you ever leave this house again. And so uh, that's a predictable routine. And then he gets over it. Now, as I was preparing for this sermon, this is another example of wanting to be in someone's presence. Uh, my wife, I told her, hey, I'm going to go work on the sermon. She said, okay, I'm going to go read a book. I think Allison gave her some books to read. And so on her trip, she started the book, and now she wanted to finish it. I said, okay, well, can you come into the study and just read in there with me? Now, sorry, this is a little mushy, right? A little mushy. But I said, you know, I just want you to be in there. I knew the reality of it was we weren't really going to be able to talk. I was going to be busy studying. She was going to be busy reading. But I just wanted her to be in my presence. Oh, isn't that, isn't that sweet? I think uh, brownies in my future? Maybe? I don't know. So, but God's revealed this same attitude to us, hasn't He? Of wanting to be with mankind in their presence since the beginning of Earth's history. And even I thought of this while walking in. I was talking about the story of the cat there with my wife saying, yeah, that's going to be in the sermon. Um, even the cat, you know, when he gets cranky after we haven't been there with him. I thought, you know, the Bible says God is a what? A jealous God, isn't He? So, I don't mind that from God if He gets a little cranky when I haven't spent time with Him. It just shows that He loves me, Right? He wants to spend that time with me. Now, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. We'll start there. And just quickly work through um, the Bible here. Genesis 3.8. Let's, let's turn there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Or scroll there, or tap there, or whatever you got to do. We just need to get in the Word. Amen? Genesis 3.8. God's presence with mankind began here. The Bible says, And they, being Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Some versions say they heard the voice of the Lord God walking. I don't know. That seems like a little, a little weird to hear a voice walking. So I chose the version that says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So obviously this is after the fall. But they, they know God's voice and they hear Him walking in the garden. So God's presence, and Ellen White's pretty clear about this, they were in communion with God face to face. Amen? This was a normal activity. But after sin, we know that this didn't take place as much because of God's holiness. Just can't, it doesn't work. And our sinfulness doesn't, it's, it's not compatible as much as it used to be. Now, God also wanted to continue this though, even after the fall, didn't He? Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. Exodus 25, verse 8. God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Okay? So God still wanted to have that relationship with mankind. To be in their presence. Okay, let's go on to Babylonian captivity. So Israel has fallen away. God says, i got to let you go. They're taken captive by Babylon. But there was still some, you could say, remnant believers that were faithful, right? And I, I want you guys, this is a little Bible trivia this morning. What were the three furnace goers, the three that got thrown into the furnace, what were their original names, their Jewish names? Nathan, give me one. Ananiah. I heard one over here. Michelle. No, that, that, that's their Babylonian name. So Ananiah. Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25, we find a fourth in the furnace. Who was that? 
is one like the Son of God, right? One like the Son of God. And that, that would have been Jesus. So here we find Jesus still dwelling with His people through a fiery trial. Literally, right? He's there. So He hasn't... This is, this is awesome, isn't it? He's still showing evidence that He still wants to be with mankind. Amen? Now, no greater example than what we find in the book of John, chapter 1. Let's go there. John chapter 1, and verse 14. John chapter 1, and verse 14. Let's read this one out loud together. I have New King James Version, but whatever you got, make it work, okay? Chapter 1, verse 14 of the book of John. Here we go. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So who is the Word? Jesus Christ. And He dwelt among us as a man. The Bible says He humbled Himself to become one of us. Whoa. Talk about a desire to dwell with us. To be in our presence. No greater example. Now, God still wants to dwell with His people today. Obviously, Jesus, the Bible says He went up into the clouds, right? So Jesus isn't physically walking among us today. So how does God still dwell with us today? Holy Spirit. Exactly. So John 16, 7. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking. He says, It's important or expedient for you that I go away. And the disciples were very sad about this, right? We just got you back. Now you're going to leave. He says, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And in 1 Corinthians 3.16, God said, or Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So we've seen throughout time, God wanted to dwell with man, starting the, before sin. He carried it into the sanctuary. And now we are His temple. His sanctuary of choice. Of where He will dwell. Amen? That blows my mind. You know, the sanctuary was a type, right? Of what's in heaven. But think about that. It was decked out in gold and precious metals. God spent a lot of time thinking about how how it should be made so that His glory could be in it. And now, really, He sees us as that precious, doesn't He? Because He dwells in us. He sees us as precious. His precious jewels. Right? Awesome. So so God has always wanted to dwell with us. And that is part of a friendship, isn't it? can't be friends with somebody somebody without being in their presence. It's kind of like Facebook. I have a lot of, well, I don't have as many friends as some people do probably, but am I really in their presence? It it helps keep that contact. I like that about it, but it's like those trips. You know, sometimes I, I went to Denver to work with a Mark Finley Bible seminar, and when I was there for six months, when I met back up with my wife, my girlfriend at the time, we had to kind of get to know each other. And, you know, how does this work again? Six months away, you know. There's a renewing period there. But God's never wanted to leave our side. And so He sent His Spirit to be with us at all times. Now, what are some other ways God extends His friendship to us? Well, James 1.17 says He gives us gifts. Every good gift 
Every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That takes me into the next element. If there's no variableness, He is truthful. Now, how many of us would say, you know, if I had a choice between an untruthful friend and a truthful friend, what am I going to pick? <laughs> the truthful friend, right? And so God, it says in Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So if He promised you that there's eternal life, you can trust Him. It's available to you. John 14.6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, come on, the what? The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So, Jesus said this world has nothing in him. The prince of this world has nothing in him. There's no deceit in God. Have you ever thought of that before? God's all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent. And... What if he wasn't a loving God? Ah, yikes, right? Yikes. But he can't change. That's who he is. Thank God. Amen? Thank God that he is truthful. He can be trusted. He also gives us hope in a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Amplified Version says, For I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for peace and well-being, and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. We made the yearbooks this year, and on the back of our school yearbooks, that's the verse. We want our kids to not see God as some mastermind that just is playing chess with their lives, but we still want them to know He has plans for them, hope for their future, not to harm them, but to give them a future and a hope. Now, John 15, 13. Another way God extends His friendship to us. He makes sacrifices for us. Not only that, He, becomes, he became the ultimate sacrifice for us, didn't He? Right? John 15, 13. Let's go there. John 15, 13. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. For his friends. Hmm. Now the Bible is very clear that we were once God's what? Enemies. It says, wow, yeah, a righteous person would maybe, you know, you might be willing to lay down your life for a righteous person, someone who's good. But God did it while we were still yet enemies. Whew, talk about a friend. That's a true friend, amen? A true friend. Again, Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times. And God has proven that, hasn't He? All right. Let me get out my history of redemption book here. I was reading this. Heather received this from my parents when she was baptized. We were baptized together, by the way. What an experience. See, God leading Heather, she was raised Catholic. I was raised Adventist. And I remember we dated for a while, and, and I, I know her dad didn't think highly of me, and I wouldn't have either at that time. <laughs> to be honest. And so Heather started coming to Oak Grove Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church. When, that was where I was raised and grew up in and was baptized my first time when I was 13. And so Heather and I went to some seminars there. And, you know, they were a little disappointed with the turnout. But man... I can't wait till they get to heaven and hopefully they see a bunch of stars in their crowns for bringing Heather and I back into the church. Because you just never know. 
Look at Paul, man. Paul changed the world. One guy. One guy. So, anyway, I digress. She got this for, from my parents at her baptism. I want to read it. hope you don't mind, dear. It says, What an exciting privilege it has been to watch you grow in Christ day by day. We have truly seen God leading in your life. There's nothing but pure joy today as we watched not only Matt, but you declare your commitment to Jesus by your baptism. May God be with you every day of your life. Love, Steve and Connie. And he is. He's, he has been, hasn't he, dear? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we just read about that, didn't we? In our Bible study. God wants to be with us every day of our lives. He is there for us every day of our lives. Now, Proverbs 7, 17, or 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. And I'd, I'd heard this growing up, and I just recalled it again when I was thinking about this sermon. The beginning of patriarchs and prophets. Have you heard this before? The first paragraph, actually the first sentence, says God is love. God is love. Okay, that's from 1 John 4, 16. And now this is called the history of redemption. So she goes through thousands and thousands of written words and pages of, from beginning of time till the end of the great controversy. And guess what's at the end of the great controversy? What does it say? She says the controversy is ended. Whew, I can't wait. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. That hit me. That really hit me. Because I don't know about you guys, but there is disharmony all over the place in this world today. Amen? But we can have the hope of where God resides purely and fully that one pulse of harmony and gladness will beat through the vast creation. From Him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare one thing. You know what that is? God is love. God is love. God is love. That's the main reason I felt called to be a teacher. <laughs> you know, they say, those who can't teach. I'll be honest, I didn't know when God called me back into the church what He wanted me to do. And so I just kind of felt my way through it and prayed a lot. And uh, he, he drug me along, sometimes fighting tooth and nail, sometimes very willingly. And it, because it's fun. It's fun following God. It's not always easy, but it's, it's a blast when you can look back and see, yep, Ellen White was right. God is love. And so when I decided to teach, I felt like God was saying, Matt, just teach others that I love them. You know? We have all these curriculums and standards and things you got to teach. But that's, that's the main reason I teach. A little secret there. That's the main reason I teach. Share God's love with other kids. Hopefully lead them to Christ. Um, Yesterday, we were, or Thursday, we were trying to get our classroom set up, and I had some old, we do Bible journaling there at our school, and I'm going to share a little bit of my own journal later, uh, and it's, it's, it's very crucial to be able to look back and see how God led us. You know, when you're in the thick of a battle, or on the mountaintop, it's awesome at that point, or, or you don't, you know God's helping you through that at that point, maybe. But then life goes on, right? And it's neat to look back. So I, I had these little booklets. We, we went through the book of Luke, didn't we, Kevin? And at the very end, one of the last questions is, if you had one question to ask Jesus, what would you ask Him? And so it was just, it was awesome to see my calling being fulfilled as I read those, those questions because they, they amazed me. You know, I would, 
I'd ask, you know, things like, why don't I have a Ferrari? Or something like that, you know? But these kids, they wanted to know why, why Jesus didn't preach more when he, when he was on earth. That's an awesome question. I never thought of that. Why didn't he preach more? That shows me they want to hear more of his words. Uh, why, why did he die for me? These kinds of things. Okay? Isn't that cool? And so it shows me, praise God, that our kids are getting to know Him. And that takes me to the last uh, section of my sermon is, hopefully by now we know that God is our friend. Amen? But how do we become His friend? How do we become His friend? Well, three main areas of focus. Number one, we can become his friend through communion and prayer. Through communion and prayer. Now this isn't necessarily focused on the communion where we take bread and drink wine, right? That is essential. But this is a different kind of communion. This would be a communion with God where you're you're confiding in him. It's an intimate relationship. Uh, You're walking with him. Like Adam and Eve. Remember they said they heard Him walking in the garden? They had taken walks with Jesus and spoke with Him. Exodus 33.11 says, God spoke with Moses. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. As a man speaks unto his friend. Here's the steps to Christ's quote I alluded to earlier from page 93. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. It's awesome. That's one thing I really, truly appreciated when I started to get to know God again. He doesn't have strings attached. I'm not a big social butterfly. I don't like big social gatherings necessarily where I have to small talk. I think that's an introvert thing, I guess. I don't know. You know, how's your day going? How's your week going? Yeah, that's great. I like real conversations, but it's hard to get there, right, in social gatherings because you might just be meeting the, first pers- the person for the first time or whatever. But this is how God is with us. He wants to be real with us. He wants us to be real with Him. Whatever's on your mind. If the day stinks, let Him know it. If, if you don't feel like going to church, let them know it. I don't know, whatever it may be. Maybe it's a huge blessing. Of course, we should let them know that, right? Of course. But whatever it is, we can confide in Him and we can trust Him with doing so, right? Sometimes you want to share something on your heart and you go, I'm not sure I can confide in that person. But God, we can. He's proven we can. Um, so I talked about my, the kids having a Bible journal, right? And so I, I was going to a men's group, and someone at the men's group said, you know what? Kind of said it under his breath. I have a journal. <laughs> right? Doesn't sound like a very manly thing to do, so, you know, in some circles. I said, I don't care. I'm ready to get closer to God, and if that worked for you, I want to try it. And so I went out and bought me a journal, and you know what? It does. It really helps. It really helps. So I wanted to share with you guys some of the things that um, I've opened up to God about in my journal. It's not, don't worry, it's not going to be like, uh, uh, is it Dr. Phil that asks people personal things on stage or whatever? It's not going to be that intimate, but I just wanted to show you that looking back, I can see God working in my life because of, because of this journal, okay? All right, let's see here. Let's start a few here. Here we go. I asked a prayer request of a friend, and it was answered quickly. I actually remember this specific night. I was here. I came here for, I think it was the chili contest, right? Ooh, some good chili. I'm driving home. And some of you who have been in leadership in the church 
you might have experienced this before. Just a dark cloud all of a sudden just comes over you, and you don't know why. And you feel really down and discouraged. I was like, what's going on here? I just had a great time. I had a lot of chili. It's good chili. And now I feel just in the dumps. So I call a friend, he answer, and he answers his phone, and I say, hey man, would you mind praying for me? I just, I have this bad feeling, and I just can't shake it. And so uh, he prayed for me, and I said, I don't know, I said, and God answered quickly. Um, and actually what I did is I pulled over and texted him, hey, would you mind praying for me? And then I went back to driving, and you know how you can hear your little phone go bzzz or or whatever notification sound you have? And I knew it was my friend. And as soon as that text came in, that cloud lifted. And later, yes, students, I pull over to read my text. Later, I pulled over to read it and he said, hey, I just prayed for you. Whoa! Was God there? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Let's go. Let's find another one here. I got. Okay. Antoline. Did he leave? Yes. Bummer. All right. I wrote in here. I said, Antoline, one of our students, was baptized today at the It Is Written seminar by John Bradshaw. Many of you probably attended. It says, This Sabbath was a high Sabbath for sure. Amen. Amen. All right. I got one more here. So we got a new, a new car to us. It's a used vehicle. And Heather calls me up. She's at Red Robin one day. And says, I'm stuck. This is like three weeks after bu buying the car. I go, what? You're stuck. She goes, it won't move. I put it in reverse. It won't go backwards. And I can't put it in drive because there's a car parked in front of me. And so... <laughs> And I, you know, she can't go anywhere. And I said, what is going on? So um, I told her to do a few things, try this, try that. She said, okay, I think it's going to work. So I hang up. Well, and I'm happy. Yay! And then she calls me right back. Nope, didn't work. And now I'm like two inches from the bumper in front of me. <laughs> and I go, okay, I'm coming up there. And I'm like 20 minutes away at least. I said, I'll come up there and I'll, I'll try to see what's going on. And so I'm, I'm praying on the way. I go, Lord, we just bought this car. This guy assured me the engine's good. And now I'm like, it, sound, it sounded like a transmission problem. It really did. And that's, you're, you're done. Your engine's cooked, if that's the case. And I'm like, Lord, just please, please, anything but the transmission. <laughs> Phone rings. I answer it, I say, how's it going? She says, it moved! It moved! I'm on my way home, I'm on my way home. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, those are some happy instances. I have some sad instances in there too. We had a pet pass away recently. Um, I've had some spiritual battles that I've confided in the Lord with, you know? And... He's there for us. He's there for us. He's a true friend. But how we become a friend too is trusting Him that way. Communicating with Him. Alright, second area. We, we, we need to believe and obey Him. The Bible says Abraham was called a servant and a friend of God. A servant and a friend of God obeys the voice of the Lord which stems from belief and trust. Not out of terror or constraint. He's not into that. He doesn't want you to obey him out of fear, not, not terror. There's a, there's a fear of respect and awe of his greatness and, and who he is, but not out of terror or force or constraint. James 2, verses 21 to 23. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? There's obedience. Probably one of the greatest examples of obedience. It says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. 
And the Scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And then it ends with this. And he, being Abraham, was called the friend of God. Whoa! So if we believe and obey him, we're his friend. We're his friend. You know, Ellen White's very clear about this. Faith is good, but unfortunately a lot of nominal Christianity today just wants to believe and get that forgiveness, right? I believe in Jesus, so I'm forgiven. But she's very clear that without obedience, it's dead. Your faith is dead. Paul's very clear about that too, isn't he? He says, show me your faith without works. Without obedience. If you really trust God, if you really believe in Him, that He created you, that He has a plan for you, a hope for your future, we should obey Him. And the third and final part is we allow God to teach us and we teach others about Him. We share Him with others. So let's go to John 15.15. 15. Maybe you're still around there. John 15.15. 15. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. This is a sermon I've been wanting to get into for a long, long time because I've always wondered this transition that Jesus talks about in John 15, 15. He says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I've made known to you. There's that transition. He's talking to the disciples there. He says, I'm not, I'm not just your master anymore. And you're not just my servants. We're friends. We're friends. And he says, why? Because I've shared everything with you that I know. Everything I've shared with you I know. And then of course he gives them the great commission, right? Go and share it with others. So, that's the third and final phase of becoming God's friend. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he says, And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we're back to Proverbs 17.17. 17. Say it with me. A friend loves at all times. At all times. Even to the end of the world. And then we see in Revelation 21, let's go there for closing. Revelation 21. Beyond this world, amen? Revelation 21. We'll start in verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and I heard a loud voice, interesting, his sheep hear his voice, amen, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, ooh, look at this, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Ooh. Ooh. And it goes on to be clear, there's only going to be two groups in these times leading up to these, this new earth and the new heavens. And we usually think in terms of uh, wicked and righteous, which that's true. But there's also two groups of Christians, and I'm speaking to Christians today, right? There's two groups of Christians leading up to, wait a minute. I'm speaking to Christians today, right? Amen. Okay, amen. Okay. I couldn't pass that by. Uh, 
in two groups of Christians Jesus mentions, and Scripture mentions, and it's kind of sobering, but we're all still here and we're all able to still make our own choices. And so I'm going to make an appeal here after I describe these two groups. So in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in, the, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So there's a group of Christians who didn't become friends with Jesus, did they? They're not obedient. They don't know him. They did a lot of things in his name. That's sobering and and makes me think, you know, what are my motives for doing what I do as a Christian? I, I'm not going to get to the pearly gates and be able to unroll my list of deeds and say, this is why I deserve to be in heaven. Right? That's not the reason we're going to get there. Let's read about the other group in Galatians chapter 3. Verses 26 through 29 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There's the other group. Doesn't matter if you're male or female, Jew or Greek. There's a spiritual Israel today that we can be a part of. Amen? The descendants of Abraham, the father of faith, the one who is called the friend of God. So, even in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, and Abraham's included in there, people were waiting for a city with foundations made by God, right? And in Revelation 21, if you, fit, if you continue that chapter, it talks about the foundations of the city, the tribes of Israel, made out of precious jewels and stones, and the gates are going to be flown open wide, never to be shut, but some people won't be allowed in. Some won't be allowed in. But there's no excuse not to be in there because we can have faith in Jesus Christ. We can put on Jesus Christ. We can be baptized into being new creatures because of Him. Alright, so that's my appeal. If you want to be in that group, would you please stand? For closing prayer, I'm going to read a song. And I want everyone to bow their heads, close their eyes, because I'm going to ask for something else here, a decision to possibly be made. But as I read this, just close your eyes and listen to these words from Jesus, what a friend for sinners. But before I read the words, if anyone does want to be baptized into Christ so they can put Him on as their reason for getting into those gates, just raise your hand. Let him know. You appreciate the friend he is. You want to get to know him better as the friend he is. And dedicate your life to serving him. But at some point, you're going to make that tra transition. And he's going to say, you're not my servant. We're friends. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. 
Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me whole. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing. He, my strength, my victory wins. Even when my heart is breaking, He, my comforter, helps my soul. He hath granted me forgiveness. I am His, and He is mine. Hallelujah! What a Savior! Hallelujah! What a friend! Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Amen. Number 499, what a friend we have in Jesus. and yet you still want to be our friend. And Lord, I don't know each person's individual walk, but I know this. We all need a friend. We all need a friend. And I just hope and pray that we remember you during those trials and temptations when we feel weak, when we've been blessed, and then... When it's all said and done, we can again speak to you face to face, walk with you in the garden. We look forward to that day, and this Sabbath day is just a little taste, so we thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs> 